Thanks, everyone, for joining us back at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad to join. Uh, we're very glad to invite back on the show Richard D. Wolf, who's a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, a visiting professor in the graduate program in international affairs of the New School University in New York City. He's the founder of Democracy at Work and host of the nationally syndicated show Economic Update. His books include The Sickness is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself, Understanding Socialism and Understanding Marxism. And his work can be found at democracyatwork.info. Professor Wolf, thank you so much for joining us back at the show. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. So I want to start off by discussing a point that you made in a recent article in Counterpunch titled Empire Decline and Costly Delusions. Uh, I feel that a few things are true here. It's true that the proxy war, the U.S. proxy war in Ukraine against Russia is a total abject failure. It's also true that a lot of nations are just clinging to the U.S., uh, either equally delusional about U.S. power or just short-term greedy. Uh, you know, Sweden joining NATO, France threatening to send troops to Ukraine, etc. It seems like a bit of like a, a two-step on the global stage. And I'm wondering, I, I wanted to get your take here, how much uh, will these loyalties to U.S. empire bo bolster the U.S., either politically, economically, or both? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by Europe as well. Uh, both of my parents were uh, born in Europe. My father was French and my mother German. Um, and so I've ca I speak those languages because I grew up with them. Uh, and so I follow this a great deal. And it's very, very important. You have a bizarre situation in Europe. You have governments that are overwhelmingly, with a couple of exceptions, but overwhelmingly center-right or tilting that way or moving that way. Um, at the same time, that the prospects and conditions for Europe, all of Europe, are worse than anything I have not only ever seen in my life, but imagined as ever happening. I mean, at the most basic level, and I approach it as an economist, so you know, I apologize, but that's the angle through which I look at things. Um, Europe is now finding itself caught, and I use that word, between two economic powerhouses, the United States on the one hand and China and its allies on the other. And it is a uh, harsh reality that it is not competing with either of them effectively. And it still has a long, horrible colonial legacy to overcome. And that's far from done. Uh, as evidenced by the migrational catastrophes that are all over Europe, from Sweden in the north to Italy in the south and everywhere in between. Uh, this is a very, very hard time, number one. Um, all the highest tech in the world is now monopolized either by the United States or by China and the Europeans Yes, there are some cases where they are at the forefront also. I don't want to overstate this, but the broad picture is unmistakable. Uh, Europe is not able to define and to construct a viable alternative. The right wing, having always looked to the United States as the protector, the model, and everything else, they don't know what to do other than act out their impossible situation. So that takes bizarre forms. Suddenly deciding that Russia is a great enemy. It's almost as if the Cold War, which was over, has been brought back so that you can run the same statements, make the same I mean, I heard the, the one that I found the funniest it might amuse you. A few days ago, I participated in a conference electronically in Europe and a serious uh, politician uh, whose name I won't mention, but who's pretty well known in Northern Europe, um, started talking about the domino theory. And I remember 
what I raised my hand and I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, if we let Russia win, as if he had the option of not letting Russia win, but if we let Russia win, then uh, the next there'll be Slovakia, and after that, Poland, and, and on and on and on. Or, or Sweden, it didn't stop at Eastern Europe, it went all across Western Europe as well. Um, and he said, this is a very serious reality. And so I decided I would have fun with him. And I said, you know, I remember the domino theory. I was a college student back in the war in Vietnam when, when the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States warned us repeatedly about the domino theory, that if the communists won in Vietnam, well then, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, and fill in the blank, would all do it. And I said, you know, it was a shock to all of us when, when the United States lost the communists in, China, in Vietnam won, and not a single domino ever happened. It might lead a more mature look with historical graph. The guy was, he didn't know what to do. He just didn't know what to do. And I enjoyed his discomfiture uh, at this. But it's interesting when you come up with a theory like that, because it means usually you don't have much in the way of a justification. And so you're, you're, you're desperate, you're trying to hold on. It's a little bit like we do here in the United States, tell people that it's necessary to fight wars everywhere else because otherwise those wars would come here as if the war is inevitable, only the location is the issue, with, you know, which is a way of thinking that is childish and, and, and otherwise not to be taken seriously. Anyway. Long story short for the prospects of Europe, they can't get together. Their divisions are now the source of unbelievable impossibility of a coordinated uh, program. And so they limp some more, some less in the, in the bag of the United States, even though the country that was always the closest is now a basket case. Britain is it, a disaster as an economy their working class has suffered more than those in the rest of Europe. Uh, they're the ones closest to the United States. They were the one that was supposed to be uh, successful by breaking away from the rest of Europe, the whole Brexit disaster. All of that is now, not only, by the way, proven wrong, but even many of the stalwart supporters of Brexit have changed their mind because the wind has, has altered so I, I think what you're seeing is a kind of desperate effort by the center right, long associated with subordination to the United States, trying to hold on by hyping that role. In other words, by literally re-stimulating the Russia versus America, because in that story, they know what their place is. And they have a population they hope will remember all of that trauma and give them the benefit of the doubt. So they become the creators of the, the demonized Putin uh, club. You know, it's just bizarre to watch in Sweden with and Finland with their shifts from the more neutral position they used to enjoy occupying to now embracing NATO at the worst historical moment uh, imaginable. And I don't think, you know, of course I could be wrong. I don't think this is a sustainable arrangement. I, I don't think you're going to see the mass of people willing to, to, to decline, which is what's happening in Europe. I mean, I don't mean to be mean-spirited, but much of the European self-delusion was based, good and bad, on Germany that Germany was the powerhouse economy and would somehow carry Europe, even though, to be honest, much of Germany's achievement was at the expense of other parts of Europe uh, because of the way that the, um, the unified currency was created. Germany had advantages it should not have had. And the, the what the Germans call Wirtschaftswunder, which translates into English, uh, economic miracle. Their economic miracle is now shown because they're in recession, they're in terrible shape, 
to be have to been dependent on the dominance of the United States, which is gone, mm -hmm. and the subordinate position of China, which is also gone, and mm -hmm. Germany, which can't now because of its playing into this right wing pro U.S., it can't break from this game, has to deny itself cheap uh, Russian oil and gas, and the Chinese won't let them compensate by shipping stuff to China, they're done. They're sitting there. They have no way out. And the, even the if you follow, as I do, among the capitalist employers of Germany, there is a huge opposition to what's going on. They understand that their position is the sacrificial lamb here. They mm -hmm. can't export the way they did. They can't get cheap energy the way they did. That was the secret of the so-called miracle. They know it better than anyone. And now it's all gone and there's nothing in its place. And, you know, that government there, which is very weird anyway, the socialists, the Greens, and the right-wing libertarians, I mean, talk about a mess. This is a messed government that can barely function. And then you have the horrible ironies, which tells you how confused things are, that the loudest voice of demonizing the Russians comes from the leader of the Green Party, which makes no sense at all, except you have a very bizarre twisting of the politics because there's no clear way forward yeah and of course there's a lot of uh you know the east german versus west german how people feel about russia in those in those places and uh i mean i i want to get into once something that you also mentioned in the article with regards to this you know center right or far right wing rise that we're seeing really globally but uh but but in spe specifically talking about the u.s and europe uh i mean i often say that neoliberalism is what paves and smooths the road towards fascism and in your article, you write, quote, that there's a shift away from neoliberal globalization toward economic nationalism, end quote. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this economic shift and how that ties into right wing populist policies that we see, uh, specific, especially in this country from both ruling parties. Yeah, I'd love to be my, my point there. What I was trying to get at was to get folks to understand that the the neoliberal free trade globalization story of the last 30 years more or less um was a wonderful way for capitalists particularly in the united states but around the world to become much richer to find extraordinary opportunities mostly in china and in those parts of the world and and, and there is no mystery about this at all china made a decision, politically, whatever you think of it, they made a decision that they were going to offer capitalists in the West a deal. And the deal was real simple. We will give you access to our working class here in China. Okay? And our working class is highly motivated, now very well educated, especially compared to the rest of the old, what we used to call the third world, uh, and very low wages. So you're getting a disciplined, organized, educated, low wage. Uh, you can't beat that. But better than that, we're going to give you access to the fastest growing, largest market in the world for everything. And you know, if you go to business school, I've taught in business schools, you teach young entrepreneur types or people who imagine that they will do that one day. You teach them that the place you want to be if you want to make money and succeed and move up the corporate ladder is where the wages are low and the market is growing. I mean, hello, you know, you don't need an advanced degree to get that. China said, we have that and we will give it to you. Uh, but you have to come here. You have to abide by our rules. You have to allow us to share or use your technology, your management organizational skills. We recognize you have those. This is a deal, the kind of deal capitalists make among themselves 
all the time. That's the deal. Nobody held a gun to their heads when Google and Apple and General Motors uh, decided to take this deal because it was profitable and they increased it and they grew it and they made a ton of money. And, and you have this situation where there is no alternative if you're serious uh, about this. And in an irony, in an irony, you have to enjoy the sort of the history of capitalism to appreciate. Nothing had prepared the American people for any of this. That's why to this day, if you ask Americans, including pretty educated ones, and they start talking about these topics, they talk about the US versus China because they don't seem to understand that somewhere between 40 and 50% of what we take from China now is produced by subsidiaries of American corporations. I mean, I could extend that argument, but it, you're not getting, you're, you're trying to use the either or of a past era and apply it to a changed situation. And that produces confusion and mess. And that's what you have here. You have a major disconnect. Russia is China's ally. It was before Ukraine, and it would be the logic if you had half a brain, if you weren't befuddled by something, if you're going to go to war against Russia in Ukraine, Russia is going to turn to its biggest, richest ally. Of course it will, number one. Number two, Russia is going to use its resources. It's not a poor country. And it's going to devote that to fighting a war. And that's not going to make it collapse any more than the United States turning to war in World War II collapsed us. On the contrary, World War II pulled us out of the Great Depression of the 1930s. It was a boost, which is exactly what it has done for Russia in spending that money to fight the war in Ukraine. And that should have been understood as not only possible, but likely. If you put these two things together, ally with China, build up their economy through defense expenditure, and we, have, we know how the United States has always done that, then you would have understood that Russia was not contrary to what President Biden said then, contrary to what Secretary of State Blinken says every other hour, or Janet Yellen at, at, the, at the Treasury. Russia's ruble isn't going to collapse. It never did. Russia isn't falling to its knees. It never did. This is all bizarre. These are miscalculations. And this was the point of that article. These miscalculations are so extreme, so off the mark, that the only really interesting question is not to blame these individuals, but to ask what, what's going on that otherwise perfectly reasonable, smart people would make such catastrophic miscalculations? And the answer is they're living in denial. They think the United States is what it was. But that, if I may be so bold, is also the problem of the leadership of Sweden, Finland, and a dozen other places in Europe who cannot get their heads around a, a changed reality. But this, is, this changed reality is not going to go away because they don't see it. That's like being a two-year-old who is frightened by a dog who barking, puts his her hands in front of his her face, and then the dogging bar, barking dog disappears until they're seven years old and they realize it doesn't work like that. We're going to see, and we are seeing. I mean, let me give you the irony of ironies. As we are speaking, there's a delegation of the biggest uh, capitalist CEOs of the United States in Beijing, hoping for a meeting with Xi Jinping, starting with Tim Cook at Apple and people like that. Why are they there? Because the Chinese are the evil communist party. They, they have nothing to do with that language. They would never use it. They are there. They are talking an appreciative language about the Chinese and their future plans. And just, uh, bleh, bleh. you know, 
the bizarre juxtaposition of these guys going there and then Mr. Our President referring to the President of China as a thug, if I remember correctly, or a murderer, or, you know, put aside the childishness of it, it is so out of kilter with the way the world is changing that you kind of stop, put your hands down, and, and worry that there could be this level of denial. Yeah, absolutely. There's actually a great video of uh, somebody asking Biden if Xi Jinping's a dictator and he goes, yes. And then there's a video of Blinken who had like just I think he had just met with him and it was just, he had worked so hard to try and undo. And then he there's a video of him going, ah, oh. <laughs> and it's beautiful. It's just wonderful. Yeah. Um, Although, you know, I, I like to tell people because they, they find it funny and it's like gossip. Uh, I was a student at Yale getting my PhD in economics at the same time that Janet Yellen was. And we were students together. I know exactly, you know, I had exactly the same education in economics as she did, literally in the same room from the same professor reading the same books. And and I know her well enough. I mean, we're not friends or anything, but I know what she learned is what I learned. And I know she knows better than what she has to say. And I, you know, I understand Politicians do what they have to do in a context, and I know she's there. But I, I, I wonder, you know, late at night when she's all alone and she's looking <laughs> in the mirror or, or listening to the music, you know, what goes through her head is having to say things that are just, she knows better, unless, you know, unless she's been drinking the Kool-Aid, that's another matter. That's also possible. But I, I find... The, the 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 statements of many European uh, politicians at the top of Europe, absolutely bizarre. A yeah. level of slavishness uh, to the United States. I mean, it really. Uh, the the other day, the British announced they were they had sent somebody I don't remember who to to China, and what here they're opening a new office in China. Why? Because they, they're, they're falling behind in access to China and they want in. You know, the same reason why Kissinger and Nixon went mm. 30 years ago not to fall behind. And, but they, they're going to talk to the Chinese ab about the uh, human rights <laughs> issues in their country. This, this behavior, as if you are coming from some moral purity, <laughs> And are explaining to these lowlifes how they should improve their act. I mean, beyond the offense that it gives to everybody in that part of the world, it is a level of 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 lost self awareness. I mean, maybe it plays to the American public or some sector of it, but other than that, this is self destructive in in the in the way it behaves. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I basically call Sweden a U.S. colony at this point um, yeah. because Sweden won't do anything unless Uncle Sam says it's OK. And I, I mean, you, you see this with not just with what's, what's happening with Russia, but also with the genocide in Gaza. And I wanted to get your take on this because some people are saying that the U.S. is loyalty to Israel will be a, a, a severe hit to it, if not politically, which it, it already is in some ways, then also economically. I was wondering if you, could you give your take on this based on uh, based on what you've been seeing and do you see an economic hit already because of, of the US support, not just, uh, not just politically, but logistically? Well, the short answer to your question is Israel is taking an enormous economic hit. And the only way it wouldn't be an economic hit is if the United States steps in and bankrolls Israel uh, to compensate for it, to offset the economic hit that this war has already uh, imposed. And I'm, I'm saying that with a level of ignorance that has to be made clear. Every Arab country and probably every Muslim country, is trying to figure out how it can strike a blow helping the Palestinians, hurting the Israelis, 
on the model of the Houthis in Yemen. They found a way to be supportive in the way they think of the Palestinian cause by interfering with the shipping in the Red Sea uh, to or from Israel. Okay, small story, having quite big effects, by the way, showing you again that a determined enemy like that you don't want. If you know American history, you'll know that the British never imagined what the Americans could do in 1776 because they had a big army, they had a big navy, and the Americans had nothing, neither one. And, you know, and the famous story, you shoot your rifle and you run a few yards, shoot it again, and hope that the British think there's a lot of people there, but it's really only you and your cousin Fred. You know, this sort of situation that Americans celebrated in school and then can't imagine anyone else playing this game is really bizarre. But I don't know how many Arab countries are figuring out right now how, with little risk to themselves, which they don't want to take, clearly, they could do something. My guess is they're already doing more than a little that we don't know about, and they will be doing more. And this is an open-ended problem for Israel and for the United States uh, to fund it. And it leads me to say something that is also applicable to Europe. And I don't mean to be an alarmist. I'm not, uh, my tendency is not to go that way. But at a certain point, the United States will face the following reckoning. It's already happening. You can see it in the maneuvers at the UN around the ceasefire resolutions in the 27 forms that they keep taking. By now, the United States and the last one abstained, having been the veto for all. You know what that is? That's Mr. Biden discovering that the popular response in the United States has not been the overwhelming Israel. That's his. And that's the upper layer of the Republican and Democratic parties. And that matches what you see in those European governments. They're coming out of what was the situation, and they're not understanding that that situation has changed. And, and But they will. That's why you're seeing these adjustments at the UN. It's already becoming clear to them that the mass of people are either indifferent or tilting towards the Palestinians as the victims in this story, or at least more so than the Israelis. They have to figure this out. This is not going to go away. This is not what they expected. It's like the war in Ukraine, not going to go away, not working out. Now, here's the alarmist message. If I were a European, I would be very worried that at some point the United States is going to reevaluate this alliance with the Europeans and see it as not much uh, worthwhile as it once was. They're going to have to come to terms with Russia and China unless they're prepared for a nuclear war, which I'm assuming they're not likely to do. They know what the Russians and Chinese can do. They're very fearful that they can do more than we can. There are already hints of that in Ukraine. Hypersonic missiles are something the Russians seem to be ahead, and who knows what else they're doing. The Chinese are beating the Americans in technology in many fields, the idea that this will not attach to defense and military is naive. And Americans are going to have to face that, either because they lose that war in Ukraine or whatever the next adventure is. And then what? Well, then the, the alliance with Europe will become much more fractured. And what happens when finally, in one or another of the major European countries, Germany, France, Italy, Britain, there is a swing to the left. Mr. Macron in France, for example, became president having won in the first round roughly 23% of the vote. 21%, two percentage less, was won by the unified left in that country. 
just 2% less. They didn't go away. They've gotten stronger, not weaker. They have a mass movement because they have a really powerful labor movement. They have another mass movement called the Yellow Vests. There are a lot of political problems on the left in uh, uh, France. But a victory by the left in France is not a crazy idea. And then what are they going to do? What And what will that mean for the other lefts? And remember, whatever you think about the right wing's ascendancy, whether it be Orban in Hungary or the Polish government or the, the rest, there is no solution to Europe's problem in beating up on immigrants. They are not the problem. They never were. And you're not going to solve whatever you do. If, if you punt and do nothing, or you simply close your borders, or you deport significant numbers, or whatever combination of those you end up doing. It's as preposterous in Europe as it is in the United States. We are a nation of 330 million people. We have an uh, undocumented immigrant population, maybe 10, maybe 15 million. Okay, you do not need an advanced degree in economics. I have one, but you don't need it to understand that 10 to 15 million of the poorest people on the planet are not a threat to the 330 million people that make up American capitalism. That's ridiculous. Now you can whip that up and make political hay for a while, but then uh, what are you gonna do? If Mr. Trump wins and deports five or 10 million people from this country, you know what? The misery, the unhappiness, the inequality of income and wealth are not going to change significantly. And what do you tell the masses of the MAGA people then? And you'll discover that maybe a left-wing version of all of that, pro-worker, will have an audience you didn't expect. You know, there's an independent running for Senate in uh, Indiana, if I'm not mistaken. No, Nebraska, Dan Osborne. And there's one running in West Virginia. These are working class people and who talk like that and who mean that and who are closer to Bernie Sanders than they ever are to Mr. Trump. And they say so. Now, why are they doing that? Why do they think there's a possibility in places that would otherwise be thought of as hopeless for that kind of politics? Well, you might see the kind of shifts. We've seen them before. Remember the crash of the economy in 1929 led to a massive shift to the left in American politics, as it did in Europe as well. That's where European social democracy took off. Okay, we may need another crash. We may be heading for one. But the right wing offers no solution. There's nothing in the Aufstand für Deutschland in Germany or the right wing. They don't have. Mr. Orban can be all about Christian civilization and anti-immigrant and that very popular, but doesn't solve the problem of Hungary, which has huge problems because it's caught in, in a, it's not acceptable to, to Russia, really, and it certainly isn't acceptable to the rest of Europe. These are, these are situations where I'm hopeful that the harsh realities will undo this peculiar leftover politics that is so out of tune with what the realities are. Well, I, uh, I hope that you are correct. <laughs> I hope that you are correct and that we see that we see that left wing turn continuing in uh, in a lot of places. I hats off always to the French and their brilliant protests and organizing. Um <laughs> <laughs> Professor Wolf, thank you so much for taking the time for sitting down with us. And as per usual, deconstructing a lot of these complex ideas and thoughts into easily digestible uh, thoughts. So thank you again. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I look forward to 
doing it again in the future if you think it, it'll be useful. Always is. Always. <laughs>